tonight inside the world's most secretive nation. North Korea's Supreme Commander Kim Jong-un is threatening thermonuclear war against the United States. With tensions escalating, Panorama spends eight days undercover inside the most rigidly controlled nation on Earth. So, welcome to the real North Korea. A landscape bleak beyond words and a regime apparently marching towards Armageddon. But is this talk of war for real? Or a regime afraid for its own survival playing a shadow game? We may see a, a thermonuclear war. I'm sure it's not the North Koreans' plan to unleash that kind of a thing. But it might come to that as a result of a, a disastrous miscalculation. We're flying into the strangest nation on Earth. Unstable, paranoid, aggressive. And after its latest nuclear test in February, even China, its old ally, voted against it at the UN. No wonder North Korea is fast running out of friends. Journalists are all but banned from North Korea, so I'm going in undercover, part of a tour group. Guide number one the regime's human face. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello. I'm glad to meet you uh, here in Pyongyang. It's immediately clear we've come to North Korea at an interesting time. At the moment, the, tense, the situation is very tense, as you know. Nobody knows when the war will provoke, but anyhow, we'll be safe in our country. <laughs> you know, our boss has that mark. The Korean International Travel Company, so the Americans won't <laughs> strike our bus. <laughs> our guide number two says hello. So, good afternoon, everybody. So, I'm a guide from KITC. So they were both our guides and also our ever vigilant escorts. We're on an official eight day tour, so the guides put us up in one of the top hotels in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Pity about the lights. This is our, our hotel in the centre of Pyongyang. This is the toilet. There are no lights, stinks, but all is on the floor. And here's the view outside the hotel. They're building a bank, night and day. Day and night. So four in the morning. They never stop. I'm told it's a joint venture with a Chinese bank. A rare sign of inward investment. First stop. This is tourism, Stalin style. Joining us today is the trip's official cameraman. He films us, we film him. He films us filming him. This is a controlled society, but what's the ideology behind it? The official video they made about the trip, with their words and music given to us at the end, provides a clue. This is monument to party founding. It was erected in October 1995 to mark the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Workers' Party of Korea. So there's the hammer, there's the sickle, and there's the paintbrush. Workers by hand and by brain. It feels like symbols of an old religion. The main square. Many see North Korea as a communist state. One year ago, Marx and Lenin still had pride of place. But this year on our trip, they've gone. Now you see them. Now you don't. 
So what sort of system is this? North Korea has a higher share of the population in uniform than Nazi Germany and fascist Italy had until the Second World War. So I think it's much more accurate to look at North Korea as a far-right state, an ultra-nationalist state. It is deeply racially biased. Uh, Koreans are taught that they are superior. Kim Jong-il was an unabashed admirer of Hitler and copied him quite consciously. Down to details like the Nuremberg marches, which are staged in Pyongyang to this day. At the mausoleum, tourists are banned from taking cameras in. Kim Il-sung has been dead these past 19 years, but he still calls the shots. As far as I know, it's the only nation in the world ruled by a dead man. Generalissimo uh, Kim Il-sung is still the, the leader of the country. But he's a corpse. I'm sorry, you don't understand the North Korean ideology, the, the religious nature of this. He is a, a kind of uh, god. He lives eternally. As does his son, Kim Jong-il, Kim Too, who lies in his own glass box. When he died nearly two years ago, his younger son, Kim Jong-un, then 28, took over the family firm. Kim III was schooled in Switzerland, became a general at 27, and has linked his star firmly to the military. So North Korea's ultra-nationalist, militaristic, and its leaders are gods, a worrying combination. In North Korea, if you say the wrong thing, you will die. You will be sent to a political prison camp. Even if one knows, sees or hears something, one must pretend to be ignorant. Disagreement isn't an option. Disagreement means death. The ideology may be terrifying, but does this place really work? At this bottling plant, on the production line, no production today. The military seems to work on the road, anti-aircraft guns. Next, time to pay homage to Kim the First. I bow. It's what's expected given the godlike status of the Kims. It's at the entrance of what we're told is a collective farm. You get the feeling this isn't an ordinary farm. I might be wrong. So where are the crops, the fields, the animals? Instead, propaganda drums out from loudspeakers all day long. So what about the farm workers? Where do they live? They show us a model house, complete with model family, model kitchen, and a fridge full of food. But this didn't seem to have anything to do with farming. Pretty much a real life farming experience. Off to a spa hotel set aside for the regime's worthies and foreigners like us. Breakfast in a gilded cage. We sneak out of our spa hotel. The barbed wire separates us from the locals. North Korea is one of the poorest places on earth. So, welcome to the real North Korea. Life is bleak here, no reliable power, 
No freedoms as we know them, not even to travel to the capital without permission. Please don't take photos. The more we see, the worse it gets. Our tour guides are anxious for us not to capture the poverty. No, no photos, no photos. Here, a woman washes clothes in an icy river. People scavenging in mud. And if this is a market, there wasn't much on sale. No smoke from this chimney. It looks as though it's been idle for some time. They take us to a showroom for this giant industrial complex. They make electricity generators here, they say. There goes the electricity again. We ask for a tour of the factories. Now the Korean Peninsula situation is getting worse and worse on the verge of Korean War. So they are now producing the military things. So we can't, they can't show the whole factory. To us, they use the war as an excuse when things go wrong. Do they do the same with their own people? When you talk to North Koreans about the state of their country, uh, a lot of them recognize that North Korea is very backward and very poor. But they tend to blame that on outside interference, American sanctions, and in, indeed, if a light bulb blows in Pyongyang, people will say, blame America. Day four. It's good morning, Pyongyang. Until we switch on the TV news. That very morning, we cross into the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, where North Korea stops and South Korea starts. It's the most dangerous place on earth, some say. Our guide agrees. This area is the battlefront, so be careful all the time. So do not use your camera. This is what the fuss is all about, the border with South Korea. Today, it doesn't feel like a battlefront. No movement, no maneuvers, no big guns. But the DMZ's history is at the root of the North's current paranoia about America. In 1950, North Korea, supported by Stalin and Mao, invaded the South. The Americans, the British and others helped the South fight back. Bombardments by tanks and here by Canadian gunners have been effective in blasting the Reds from strong positions. Three years later and one million dead, the border was back to where it had been, the 38th parallel. The two sides declared a ceasefire, but there's never been a peace treaty. <laughs> Here, who started the war still matters. I ask if it might have been the North. That's, that's not true. true. It's not true. No, it's not true. Okay. But is there going to be another one? In Britain, we're less afraid because we are further away. Something gets lost in translation. <laughs> <laughs> North Korea first tested a nuclear bomb seven years ago. Now their latest propaganda claims their rockets could hit the U.S. mainland. Interview로 말하면. Washington DC를 정조준한 여력 타격은 세계를 감시하는 미국의 눈과 귀를 단칼에 도려내는 것이고 
In reality, they could hit South Korea, Japan, and possibly American bases in the Pacific. At the border, on a day when Pyongyang is boasting its rockets are primed and ready to fire, it couldn't be more peaceful. But on the far side of the Blue Hut, something's missing. Usually, there's South Koreans on guard, sometimes Americans too. Today, it's eerily quiet. At the moment, this is a war of words, but will, will there be a shooting war? But for now, they're relaxed enough for tourist snaps. Next stop, a few miles north of the border, it's that man again. Kim the First, cult of personality, is everywhere, reforming people's thoughts. It certainly would appear that the North Koreans are brainwashed. When you talk to North Koreans, you can have a normal conversation and think I'm really dealing with a human being, and then all of a sudden they go into this uh, robotic-like uh, uh, recitation of North Korean policy, and you want to shake them and say, come on, get real. But there are signs that the regime's icy grip on information is beginning to crack. This is the strangest thing. Here's an iPhone, and you can pick up a signal um, from the south, which is only a few kilometers away. If I can do this, so can a North Korean. The country now has one million mobile phones, officially blocked from international calls, but all this makes it harder to keep people brainwashed. Mobile phones are very important in communicating information quickly about what is going on inside North Korea. I suspect you'd find that the chattering class in Pyongyang know very quickly about events that happen in the Northeast. This is quite a big change. A night out in Pyongyang. Our guide has a lullaby for us, the nation's reunification song. As the regime talks up thermonuclear war, our other guide sets out the Sinatra Doctrine. Back at the hotel, the power's off again. Now you don't see the lights, now you do. Look at this shot taken from space. Compare the night sky. The north puts out a sad glowworm. The south blazes with light. A few miles south of the border, it's as if you're on another planet. Welcome to South Korea. As you can see, it's just like North Korea. Well, it might be a bit different. In South Korea, you've got all sorts of things you don't have in North Korea. Shops, adverts, individuality, freedom of religion, freedom to go for a walk. There are 25,000 defectors from the North here. The question is, why aren't there more? I'm here to meet a doctor from the North who is now free to speak, albeit anonymously. South Koreans wonder why North Koreans do not rebel. Brainwashing starts in the womb. It becomes natural to bow to the portraits of the Kims every morning. Back in the north, on the outskirts of Pyongyang, we pass a military convoy. And in town, they're testing the public address system. 
something's going on. We've seen loads more soldiers in town today. They're very difficult to film, but you can feel the tension rising. The problem is, it's impossible for us to ask what's really happening. We don't know. Instead, there's a trip to the People's Library. I asked for one particular book. Um, 1984, oh. the name of the title. Or any English book. George Orwell predicted a world where the threat of constant war kept the masses subdued. No 1984, but they have got discovering food and nutrition. Grimly ironic, because though you wouldn't know it in Pyongyang, mass starvation is the regime's darkest failure. In the 1990s, North Korea lost its old mentor, the Soviet Union. The economy collapsed. It suffered one of the worst famines in modern times. Maybe one million died, maybe more. But images like these would never be shown in North Korea. This man escaped seven years ago. Back then, Ji Seong Ho was starving. While stealing coal from a train to sell for food, he fell under the train's wheels and lost a leg and a hand. I think I lost my mind from dizziness, sleep deprivation and hunger. My grandmother and my neighbors died of starvation. When you went into the cities, train stations, markets and alleyways, you found lots of dead bodies. I do not know the exact number, but countless people died. Countless. Officially, the famine was downplayed, but malnutrition continues. Two years ago, the UN estimated that six million people, a quarter of the population, needed urgent food aid. We're on the road again, heading over the mountains east. Due north of here is something our guides would never, ever show us, the North Korean Gulag. These shocking images appear to speak to life and death inside the regime's concentration camps. Panorama has tracked down a defector brave enough to go on camera to tell his story. Young Gwang Il was a prisoner in Camp 15. How did they bury the dead in the winter when the ground is cold? No, we don't bury them. We leave the dead bodies in a warehouse till April. We bury them in April. When we go to bury them, they're already rotten and totally decomposed. So they're shoveled like rubbish and buried. How many bodies in one hole in the ground? Up to 70 to 80 people. Has the new leader acted to close down the Gulag? Far from it. Defectors say the camps are getting bigger, not smaller. Day seven, we've been taken out of the city. In Pyongyang, they stage a military parade. The regime is shaking its fist at the world. For us, a ride on the metro. No ads, and it just so happens to be the deepest in the world. Handy if the war ever did go nuclear. This is the first moment we bump into ordinary North Koreans. Even in the tube, the regime's wall of sound never lets up. There are times when it feels like we're inside a doomsday cult. The papers are full of warmongering and martial songs. Artillery of the sacred mountain will have its answer. But the military first policy has a price. On the day the regime orders its forces on standby, 
They take us to one of the country's biggest hospitals. Here, the doctor says, they can care for 1,300 patients. In the mausoleum, it was light and warm. And in the hospital? It's freezing. At least the power is on. But it's gone again. They show us a series of fancy machines, a CT scanner, UV lights, but something's missing. We haven't seen a single patient yet. There are no patients here? What? There are no patients. Mostly in the, in the morning, they cure the disease. Normally, they treat the patients in the morning. So why aren't we allowed to see them? We asked the doctor who defected about her experience of North Korean hospitals. If you, as a doctor, had said, we need more money for medicines for the patients, what would have happened to you? If that happens, they would kill me, the next day or even that same day. They would kill you regardless of your ranking. Even a high-ranking official would be killed. Everyone knows that. It's the end of our tour, and we still haven't seen any patients. Tell the doctor, we're not fools. We haven't seen any patients. Please don't treat us in this way. The doctor explains that we can't see patients without their permission, but we can't ask for that without seeing them. Catch-22. Then they take us for a treat. And who should I bump into in the stalls? What feels like the entire North Korean officer corps. Top billing at the circus, soaring above the trapeze, a rocket. The officers go wild. Do they mean it, or are they too putting on a show? The people are indoctrinated to believe that North Korea must exercise military power. When I lived there, we used to say it would be better for a war to break out so everyone can die together and see the end. But what if this High Wire Act, blaming foreign enemies for its own failures, goes wrong? North Korea is on a collision course with the United States and South Korea. We may see a thermonuclear war, but it wouldn't be because the North Koreans wanted it. But it might come to that as a result of a, a disastrous miscalculation. North Korea's military first philosophy has its own peculiar logic. The untested leader of the soldier state must threaten war to stamp his authority at home and abroad. Unless China, his major ally, reigns him in, there's a danger that he could take that logic too far. Kim Jong-un is not yet fully in control, I think. Uh, he needs to keep showing that he's strong. He wants to be the North Korean leader who forces the United States to come to the negotiating table on North Korean terms to admit that North Korea is a nuclear weapon state and preferably to give North Korea large amounts of aid. My friends in North Korea say they cannot live anymore. He keeps insisting that he wants a war when the markets are closed and there is nothing to eat. On the day we left, North Korea declared a state of war with its neighbor. For the moment, Kim III remains armed with nuclear powers, the most dangerous man on the planet. Max on BBC One goes straight to jail in a revealing new documentary series, The Prisoners. On BBC Two, Lucy Worsley explores how royal illness has shaped the health and history of the nation. And new on Three, the Baby Britain season continues with another first-time dad learning the ropes.